I'm delighted to um, welcome to uh, the Metropolitan History Seminar today uh, Simon Slight, um, who is Senior Lecturer in Australian History at King's. Um, Simon started out at Warwick. He did spend a time in UCL, then went off to Monash uh, to do his PhD and has been uh, in history and the Menzies Centre between them for about the last five or six years now. Um, he's published a, um, one single authored book um, on young people and the shaping of public space in Melbourne, um, from which I guess this leads on. In, in, um, uh, and he's also more recently uh, co-edited a book on children, childhood and youth in the British world. And he's written a number of other pieces, uh, some of Australian history um, content and some more directly urban history content. Uh, but today he's going to talk on the subject of young people and the rhythms of the city towards the trans-urban history of modern walks. Simon. Thanks very much, Richard. And thanks indeed for the invitation to speak uh, with you this evening, in particular to Tom Hume, uh, now in Belfast, of course, uh, for setting the ball rolling, uh, and also to the other conveners um, of the seminar series, which is, of course, included. Hello, if you're listening at home, I suppose I should say. Um, <laughs> so help us work backwards towards the past. Let me begin by turning to a recent novel, which I have on screen here. So in his 2012 book, The Cartographer, Australian author Peter Tuig writes through the eyes of an 11-year-old boy growing up in the working-class suburb of Richmond in Melbourne during the late 1950s. Tuig lived as a child in the same locale and unfolds through his account a detailed map, which helpfully the uh, publisher includes on the inside and outside cover, uh, a detailed map of childhood expeditions that are at once fantastical and semi-autobiographical. Sometimes singing a few bars of The Happy Wanderer as he explores on foot through laneways, rail yards <coughs> and tunnels beneath the city, Tuig's protagonist surveys an urban realm simultaneously expansive and bound in the main by the invisible parameters of a suburb one kilometre or 0.6 of a mile across and 1.6 kilometres from top to bottom. The boy constructs his map uh, in order to help remember associations both good and bad, to locate shortcuts and avoid <coughs> walking into the lairs of large dogs or corrupt policemen, both of whom seem to populate this landscape uh, to a degree. Now, despite its urban hazards, the cartographer's domain is largely considered a safe setting for children. The kids down our way don't live in houses as much as appear, disappear and reappear in the streets when it's not raining, readers are told. And in recent decades, geographers and urban anthropologists have generated a considerable body of evidence to argue that since the early 1970s, children's unaccompanied home range, or what I shall call urban range, has fallen dramatically across Western nations. Both media scrutiny and public alarm <coughs> have been prompted by the apparent transition from so-called free-range children to, and I quote, cotton wool kids. The change, one British newspaper reported in 2007, can be discerned in dramatic form across four generations of the same Sheffield family. So here we have the uh, areas of um, activity of uh, a grandfather, which is the biggest uh, one you can see there. I know it's going to be quite small at the back. Um, uh, or rather, the great-grandfather. Uh, the grandfather, uh, the uh, son, who is only allowed to walk on his own to the end of his own street, 300 yards. Don't often get to show a slide from the Daily Mail, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> the newspaper article, based on a charity report by Natural England, is a rare example of an attempt to tackle this theme across an extended period of time. As with much cultural geography, environmental psychology, from which the study of children's walks originated, 
or sociology, the topic of urban rage would benefit from a longer view, so too the practice of youthful walks more generally. Despite isolated attempts by historians to offer an extended 20th century perspective for Britain, Australia, the Netherlands and the United States, the scholarship on young people's walks remains largely attenuated. What factors, one wonders, affected young people's movements within the city in an earlier era? Why were young people on the streets and in the parks in the first place? How did they adapt to the urban transport revolution <coughs> uh, in the mid to late 19th century? And is the apparently diminished realm for city uh, walks just the latest phase in a longer trend towards curbed freedoms? To discern such details arguably fulfills more than intellectual curiosity, valid, of course, as that impulse is. For if capability and mobility are indeed related, something asserted by geographer Tim Creswell, based in part on the activist writing of Amartya Sen, then adults ought to want to know about children's modern and not-so-modern walks. Any insights we can glean promise to cast light on how children and older youths experience the city and how they were regarded as historical agents. What I hope will emerge from my discussion here is the absolute centrality of children's walks to the historical urban scene. Though dwelling in a world of scattered horizons and circumscribed by factors of class, age, gender and ethnicity, young people have long stepped out into the public domain. I've got a staggered quotation on screen for you now, which I hope you'll read along with me. (coughs) Categories of age and moments of transition are often linked with acts of walking. In Western society, the patter of tiny feet is commonly anticipated at pregnancy. Later, young infants take baby steps, find their feet, and treading gingerly still, become toddlers. For courting teens, walking out once composed a common ritual of historical socialisation, whereas in traditional Aboriginal communities, the trial of walkabout saw adolescent boys prepare for the duties of adulthood. Older again, stepping out into society is a phrase associated with leaving the parental home while for many couples, walking down the aisle has long marked another significant departure. An occupation or walk of life is by now usually underway. That life lived, and the journey almost at an end, a pair of last legs carry the individual towards the inevitable. So if a language of walking punctuates the life course, Only the most observant have drawn the connections in a self-reflexive way, or situated them historically. Hal Porter's close associations of world events, the dawning of conscious memory, and walking are hence unusual. But it is possible to historicise the practice, and in so doing, mine writings on walking for evidence of experience. And so this paper attempts this for a number of city spaces from 1850 to 1914 with young people around whom coheres much of the terminology of walking, yet scant historical scholarship forming the focus. So the period under analysis bears (coughs) witness to two distinct shifts identified by historians. The decline of what has been termed the walking city, and the slow but significant change for the general populace from walking by necessity to walking by choice. The walking city is a term coined by American scholar Sam Bass Warner in 1962 in this book, and it referred in its first iteration to the city of Boston in 1850. At this time, Warner observed, the overwhelming majority of Bostonians lived within a two-mile radius of City Hall and within walking distance of shops and workplaces. (coughs) Moreover, at mid-century, Boston was, quote, a city which depended on walking for its means of transportation. (coughs) <coughs> By 1870, however, the sudden rise of Boston's streetcar suburbs had altered the patterns of city life fundamentally. With the metropolitan area now 14 times larger than it had been just two decades earlier, the walking city was effectively at an end. 
Warner's concept has since been applied to cities including New York, Melbourne and London, the three locations from which, in varying proportions, I draw my evidence this evening. As a case in point, urban historian Ken Jackson compares for London and New York two particular years, 1815 and 1875 reaching conclusions that he finds applicable to many other English-speaking cities. In the earlier moment, London, then the world's largest city, housed some 800,000 people, each, if fit and mobile, able to walk easily from the city's edge to the centre, a journey of just three miles. Here and elsewhere, Jackson observes, the walk to work was usually in fact much shorter than this, at less than a single mile. As in Boston, by the 1870s everything had altered. The desire for social differentiation, <coughs> together with new forms of mass commuter transport, meant that cities like London and New York had turned inside out, with the well-heeled now choosing to live outside the centre, together with those who could afford to commute from the new suburbs. For Melbourne, the walking city has been argued to have persisted for another few years, until about 1880 in the estimation of Bernard Salt, before the effects of the same transition <coughs> became pronounced. In each city, it should be stressed, many adults continued to walk to work at century's end, and indeed well into the 1900s. But the journey to work on foot was no longer a near universal experience, and the city limits moved outside the easy reach of pedestrians. The issue of choice is also central to the second shift mentioned just now, the rise of walking by virtue of pleasure rather than necessity. Arguing for the change in his history of walking, Joseph Amato, in this book on screen, identifies groups including ramblers, mountaineers, romantic writers and window shoppers as exemplifying a new freedom. Amato's contention is that such leisurely pursuits came late to the urban working class, <coughs> or perhaps equally apt in the 19th century, the walking class. Instead, most city dwellers, quote, came and went on foot at the command of their superiors and were often looked down upon for such exertions. Using literature as a source, Amato also extends the lifespan of the generic walking city, though without using the term, uh, to up to and even after the First World War. Such, he argues, was the power of pedestrian-based localism. Providing some statistical evidence to support this contention, Amato notes that in 1906, only around one in four working Londoners took the train, tram or bus to work. In order to address some of the scholarly, uh, some of the scholarly debates on walking cities, three inner urban precincts are brought into comparative view in the succeeding analysis. In a recent intervention contained within this book called Another Global City, Andrew Brown may has demonstrated <coughs> that from around the 1860s to the 1920s, and by inference beyond, municipalities around the world shared certain aspects of civic culture. Precincts of the global city, the urban landscapes produced in each location, from civic institutions to metropolitan parks and busy thoroughfares, were characterised by a discrete number of variables hence rendering them amenable to meaningful comparison. Now, this is decidedly not to assert that 19th and 20th century Sydney was essentially the same as Salford, or Boston the same as Birmingham, but it is to defend the utility of the comparative project begun by Asa Briggs as long ago as 1963 in his famous book, Victorian Cities. Hence, while drawing the bulk of my evidence from the meticulously kept Civic Archive of Melbourne, in what follows, I also bring to bear selected primary and secondary material on London in particular, and on New York. Though certainly different in scale, there's a few figures for you, the urban fabric and social conditions of the three historical locations were not so dissimilar. Indeed, on numerous occasions in this era, town clerks in each municipality sought through correspondence <coughs> with their overseas counterparts guidance on shared urban concerns such as how to regulate juvenile street trading. Later, uh, uh, the, the problem of uh, jaywalking, which was something that first concerned Americans. Ranging widely, I follow the trails of young people where they are best preserved in these settings. Operating on often tight margins, young people were 
less able to afford the fares for the new trams, trains or streetcars that began thickly to populate urban streets and railway cuttings from the mid-1800s. In an era before effective enforcement of compulsory schooling, youngsters were also to be found on foot everywhere in the outdoor city, working, flirting and exploring. These self-initiated activities hold my interest here, in contrast to the organised marching and processions about which I have published uh, elsewhere. Before setting out in historical pursuit, I offer next an important note on my use of the term young people and similar age-related designations. As scholars of youthful practice acknowledge, age is both a qualitative experience and a chronological category. Historically contingent and cross-cut by factors of gender, class and ethnicity, among others. <coughs> Not until 1898 <coughs> did American educationalist G. Stanley Hall begin to popularise the modern notion of adolescence, which Hall argued extended from 12 to 21 in girls and from 14 to 25 in boys. You can already get a sense there of the gendered aspect of this. Before this time, social commentators describing young people in the urban settings assessed here grasped at a shifting series of terms. Street urchin, gammon, gutter snipe, street rat, larrikin, hoodlum, hooligan and others to define what they regarded from the 1850s as a rising social problem and public menace. While I avoid the negative stereotyping redolent of such language, I do embrace some of this vocabulary especially in instances such as larrikin, where the term could also be a self-description, and focus on adolescent youthful experiences in the sense defined at the time by Hall. As well as this, my subject group also extends backwards from adolescence to include those toddling in public spaces or trooping off to primary school. And so to the first of a number of sections. <coughs> How can we know about young people's walking practices in cities past? Walking leaves relatively few traces in either street or archive, and the difficulties reported in tracking women's historical movements across city spaces are at least as pointed where young people are concerned. As noted before, the historical language used to describe walking must first be considered and penetrated. It might be possible, for example, to read from criticisms of gait and posture inferences about normative practice. Hence, the episodic censure of walking habits in the Melbourne press, where boys were attacked for their allegedly slouching and slovenly gait, young women rebu uh, rebuked for their casual saunter with heads thrust forward or inclined together to facilitate conversation, and the appearance of turned-in toes and a limp crawl blamed in 1914 on women's restrictive clothing. Well, these and other descriptions suggest by their obverse modes of carriage considered correct. Similarly, international concern about young people's roaming or roving proclivities, a particularly serious charge if levelled against girls, can perhaps be taken as indicative of a strengthening desire on the part of city fathers for purposeful walking conforming to the requirements of Victorian respectability and an economic rationale. And if we can go by the numerous, often exasperated descriptions of, quote, the leery, swaggering walk, of street-frequenting Melbourne larrikins, who were adolescents and young men who also delighted in interrupting the passage of other pedestrians with shoves off the footpath, spitting and coarse language, then Australian thoroughfares must have been lively indeed. I think the same thing applies elsewhere. Much of what might be surmised about youthful walking comes, of course, from the accounts of adult pedestrians trying to avoid such jostling. There is much to be learnt from street life, asserted this man, Melbourne's self-styled peripatetic philosopher, Marcus Clarke, in the late 1860s, and one's daily walks abroad are instructive as well as amusing. We shall in due course return to the thoughts of Clarke, as well as fellow observers, including Henry Mayhew, keeping in mind their tendency towards exaggeration for the sake of journalistic effect. Supplementing the observer's insights, the web of civic regulations affecting street traffic also promise perspectives on practice. From walk over crossings to move on bylaws and decrees on vagrancy, <coughs> the 19th century witnessed an extension of police powers to order pedestrian circulation in increasingly, <coughs> in increasingly hectic urban centres. 
Knowledge of such rules and statutes should not, however, mislead us into thinking that foot traffic in the long 19th century was especially heavily constrained. As Peter Norton has revealed in his American study of early 20th century jaywalking regulations, regulations not adopted in Melbourne and London until the 1920s and 30s and then implemented only sporadically, the Victorian era city saw pedestrians exert considerable licence in using both pavements and streets. Period photographs and film depict those on foot moving freely in between, in between trams and horse traps, with children ignoring the boundary of the curbstone to conduct their games. The dangers of such shared space, of course, fill many a column inch of the newspapers. All too often young pedestrians are reported as having fallen victim to the increasingly rapid and numerous wheels of urban progress. Film and photographs offer, uh, offer rather, tantalising windows onto young people's city walks, but uncertainties regarding the true speed of the film stock and a tendency for photographers to position stationary children before the lens render these sources problematic. In a similar way, it's worth remembering that newspaper reports tend to focus on moments of drama and conflict rather than run-of-the-mill activities. Nonetheless, the historian of experience must make the best of such qualitative sources, blunting the biases inherent in each by incorporating into any analysis as wide a range of evidence as possible. Just occasionally, too, some harder data is found buried in the archives. A case in point is the precious information on the distances young city dwellers covered on foot in 1890s Melbourne recorded at the time out of the concern to protect public parks from youthful damage. Assessed in detail later on in my talk, a few, <coughs> foot, a few footprints suffice now to lay the trail. And so it was that on the 6th of December 1899, Melbourne Parks curator John Gill Foyle recorded multiple incidents of damage in the various reserves about the city. Perhaps frustrated by the failure of, the, of uh, his colleagues to prevent the uprooting of shrubs and saplings, Guilfoyle noted that in his view the destruction had been conducted, quote, principally by boys evidently from 10 to 12 years of age by the footprints. The culprits were long gone, but the curator could tell who to look for. Following such leads, uh, this paper next addresses the youthful walks of those um, occupied more gainfully. And so on to my next section, walks for work. The relationship between walking and working is long indeed for city youth. In 17th century London, for instance, Samuel Pepys made numerous references in his celebrated diary to these people, link boys, adolescents employed to guide wealthier pedestrians through a warren of darkened streets using local knowledge and the light cast by flaming torches. Come the middle of the 19th century, the trade was still relatively brisk, as suggested by contemporary illustrations and references finding adults in various states of uncertainty and distress. From the early 1960s onwards, however, despite a brief reprise during the great fog of Christmas 1904, it appears that the Link Boy's time was over. Nowhere does he feature in Henry Mayfield's <coughs> encyclopedic London Labour and the London Poor. Nevertheless, Mayhew's four-volume survey does provide a wealth of detail on the extent of the capital's wandering tribes, as he calls them, some of them seen here, an army of itinerant workers also taking to the streets to eke out a living. Across several hundred pages, and believe me, I've looked through them all to, uh, to find the, the right bits, uh, we encounter <laughs> boys walking alongside their costermonger fathers and barrows of produce, Girls in their mid-teens hauling their wares for 8 to 10 miles a day, and among many other accounts, a report of a young chimney sweep earlier in the century, forced by his master to walk the five miles from Wanstead to Walthamstow, carrying all his equipment. For all of these occupations, both topographical understanding and a reasonable level of fitness must have been required. Such walks bestowed a measure of independence too, but often little real freedom. Famously, an eight-year-old watercress seller 
knows the route of her round, Mayhew comments, but nothing of the parks that lay just beyond. Across the seas in Melbourne and New York, young people were also involved in a great variety of peripatetic trades. Less troubling to middle-class consciences at mid-century than later, hosts of young people sold flowers or matches, ran messages for city businesses, and collected discarded items to sell on. In Melbourne, the last of these occupations was termed marining, (coughs) after the marine stores initially reliant on maritime trade. An air of of semi-legality clung to the activity and prompted legislative scrutiny from 1876 onwards. Marine store boys, it was claimed in the Colonies Parliament, opened yard doors without asking and walked into one's back premises, ostensibly to get bottles or bones or rags, but they were always ready to lay their hands on anything that came their way. Edith Anions, a Melbourne-based child-saving activist with international connections, related with a mixture of concern and pride her experiences of similar activity. Two of her ten-year-old charges, Bill and Tom, and quote now, knew every lane and right of way for miles. They knew all the wharves along the Yarra Bank and often climbed and crawled beneath them to retrieve floating beer bottles and other sources of revenue. They knew all the shortcuts and were as much at home in the city as old men. Equally savvy and fleet of foot, in both Melbourne and New York, the figure of the scurrying newsboy, dashing along the street to meet a customer's needs, became especially iconic. There are statues in America to the newsboy, for example, now. Quick-witted and lively, the newsboy was seen to embody the best characteristics of innumerable street-based apprentices across the 19th and 20th century. And there's another image from Melbourne here, and you can see the newsboy in full flight on the right. By contrast with the pursuits of their brothers, girls' street trading activities provoke consistent alarm on the part of middle-class observers. <coughs> Outnumbered by the boys, female street sellers peddling flowers, in particular, and less regularly newspapers, watercress or matches, everywhere faced accusations of hawking their virtue as well as their wares. They were sometimes, as in this image, portrayed in sexualised terms too and cast as fallen girls, pseudo-streetwalkers. So one has to ask what is for sale, really, in this image. Older female factory hands en route to and from work shared these street spaces, attracting a measure of concern and often scolding criticism, particularly for their dress. In 1891, 98 and 1916, a coalition of child savers and legislators in Melbourne attempted to prohibit females under specified ages, varying from 16 to 18, from selling in public, while restricting the age of male entry to the street marketplace to just 10. Evening roaming, as it was called, of the streets was also targeted for both sexes, albeit that no uh, thoroughgoing treatment of street trading was enacted there until 1925. Anxieties about the time of day when young people could be found on foot around the city remind us that outside the winter months, Walks for work were principally daylight activities. Yet not all juvenile work involved earning money, and a second category of excursions on foot, errands, were probably more evenly distributed around the clock and throughout the whole week. In this wonderful book, Anna Davin notes a variety of such activities for London between 1870 and 1914. Sundays, for instance, saw children in 1890s Camberwell carry joints and pies to the bakers for heating. While in Alice Lewis's Chelsea household of nine, one child or another would be tasked with walking to Harrods, pillowcase in hand, to buy three loaves of bread before moving on to stock up at the fish shop and the butchers. At other times, girls especially were directed to street markets to haggle for produce, while the sending of a child to run a message, fetch someone or pick up an item was commonplace. Children brought back beer from the pub too, much to the chagrin of temperance campaigners. And this very rare photograph from Liverpool records this practice. Elsewhere, back in London, young Arthur Harding, growing up during the 1890s in the notorious Nickel, 
an area of acute social deprivation in East London, regularly walked the half mile to Spitalfields Market to scavenge for wooden packing crates and waste potatoes, or else to carry quantities of lemons for his elder sister to sell on. He was just uh, six or seven at the time of that. His sister's list of errands further included regular walks to the local butchers seeking faggots, an an inexpensive item for a family meal. In New York and Melbourne, a similar economy of favours, also usually unpaid, operated. The winter of 1892, for example, saw two boys, aged 10 and 11, fall foul of the authorities in Melbourne for cutting down a young tree and hauling it home, presumably for use as firewood. Legal action was recommended. Walks for work were not without their risks. By 1914, paid and unpaid street enterprises were starting to trail off in western cities, at least during school hours. Class sizes were growing as attendance became the norm, part of the macro level shifts from earning to learning, and from a view of the child as an economic support for the family to a perception which considered children as emotionally priceless and requiring shelter at home. On to my next section, walking and courting. With work over, school concluded or the weekend upon them, young people returned to the streets for another series of city walks. When they described going out or walking out with one another during the long 19th century, the language used was apt and deliberate. Courtships were most often pursued outside, across an array of urban leisure zones where walking was central. Arm in arm with each other, young people were also closely entwined with a changing urban landscape privileging display. Between the 1860s and the 1890s, Melbourne's best-known meeting point was The Block, seen here, an area of shop fronts along the uber-fashionable Collins Street between Swanston and Elizabeth Streets. By 1870, parading up and down this location on weekday afternoons from 3.30 and either side of noon on Saturdays was, quote, an institution attracting the city's well-heeled and aspiring classes of all ages. Though its suitability as a place for ladies was becoming uncertain, in 1890 it was observed that young men and women, quote, make promenading the block one of the more serious occupations of their lives. Displaying status and wealth were important parts of this ritual circulation. So too were coded stares, coy behaviour and the forming of new acquaintanceships. This then was a setting for the better off to meet and to walk. Yet more important for young Melbournians, mostly less privileged uh, than those parading the block, were a variety of emergent commercial spaces around the city, some better known to historians than others. In 1883, a journalist from the Sydney Morning Herald, visiting Melbourne, described the working class frequenting here, the Esplanade, in Beachside St Kilda on Sunday afternoons, an influx influx, that dramatically accelerated with the extension to a once prestigious suburb of tramlines in 1888. (coughs) It was here... Melbourne autobiographer Elaine MacDonald observed, we see her here in her childhood years, it was here that servants and working girls had their social life, the equivalent, she said, of garden parties and races. As female excursionists, chiefly domestic servants, factory girls and barmaids, walked up and down the foreshore and onto the pier, they were ogled by lounging teenage boys and young men often smoking, described as not quite larrikins, Young fellows working in all sorts of capacities from apprentices to trades, factory hands, butcher and baker boys, later to be seen hanging round the street corners in the city centre. In 1895, the columnist Cleo surveyed an evening St Kilda crowd, uh, crowded principally by the straw-hatted youth and his companion, sweet 16, with short skirts, obviously tight stays and carefully frizzed hair. By 1914, St Kilda was still popular with young couples now surrounded by ever-increasing varieties of of seaside attractions, such as roller coasters, but more interested, it was noted, in escorting one another along the esplanade, or the pier. Back in the centre of town, the raffish Burke Street, replete with bars, sideshows, cheap theatres and a night market, provided another place of resort for walking out 
on Saturday and Sunday evenings in particular. There, the continuously peripatetic Marcus Clark encountered, quote, young ladies of sewing machine proclivities perambulating in strings of five in 1868, noting that both road and pavement were sometimes crowded with the couples. And I haven't got a, an image of that, but I have got one rather similar from a later date, 1908, of such people leaving the factory. Similar observations to Clark's were made ten years later, although by the first decade of the new century, the focus of Sunday evening activities seemed to have switched from Burke Street to here, Prince's Bridge, which you can see in the lower image, uh, adjacent to Flinders Street Station, which is in the upper image. Meeting under the clocks, which, that's not going to work, but um, there's one big clock, it's not that clock, it's that line of clocks below, <coughs> under the arch. Um, meeting uh, under the clocks on that day, in particular Sunday, youths aged 14 to 25 formed what were called marching parties, usually single sex, before processing to and fro across the bridge. Where groups encountered one another, playful remarks and giggling followed, before mixed sex pairs split off to keep company for the remainder of the evening. Other couples would forego the group promenade and meet directly at the station, taking a turn on the bridge before walking through neighbouring parks. Now, of course, there are clear similarities between these courtship practices and the so-called monkey parades of British cities during the same period. In 1905, Charles Russell wrote of girls in selected Manchester streets plucking flowers from lads' buttonholes on Saturday, or rather on Sunday evenings, as a prelude to forming an acquaintanceship. Here, such pairing off was termed clicking. In London, turn-of-the-century Hackney hosted its own monkey parade, where Natalie attired youths exchanged winks or smirks as they sized one another up. To the south, working-class Bow Road and Petticoat Lane witnessed the same scene, with walking out taking place on Saturday evenings and Sunday afternoons. And in um, his book on 20th century London, Jerry White has this image of Peckham, 1913, and the same practice uh, occurring there. The fact that sites in New York, including the Bowery and Broadway, had hosted working-class walking-out rituals since at least the early 1800s merely confirms the pervasiveness and international popularity of the practice, whatever it was called. And little wonder, argues historian of walking Rebecca Solnit. This is what she says. It was free. It gave the lovers a semi-private space in which to court. Perhaps they first feel themselves a pair by moving together through the evening, the street, the world. Now, this social practice was not without its risks. By 1914, Melbourne newspapers were reporting that walking out uh, in the location I just showed and others around the city was becoming hazardous. After retiring to park benches with their walking companions, at the end of the evening, tearful girls were finding their handbags missing. So common was the occurrence that journalists, as here, speculated on the role of male decoys acting in groups. So here's the courting couple and there's the arm going in to snatch the handbag. The police also intervened when high-spirited or inexperienced boys and girls took mashing, as it was called, or flirting, too far by bumping up against members of the opposite sex. And they also intervened to contain inter-gang enmity sparked by a girl associated with the primrose push of Fitzroy walking out with a boy from the Burke Street Rats. Concerned as they may have been by the use of city streets and parks for mashing, however, city fathers in Melbourne and elsewhere could do little to restrict the practice. Unfolding city spaces, including evening shopping destinations, gas-lit parks and beachside promenades, provided ever more locations for young people to walk and to woo and, even for the middle and upper classes, to leave behind the chaperoning conventions of the mid-Victorian period. Despite the scattered examples of distress and the underlying adult concern, consensus, rather than conflict, characterised most walking out of activities, and so the practice stands as one of the great rites of passage of the long 19th century. That's my um, penultimate section. 
historicizing urban range. Despite the abundance of contemporary data, comparatively little is known on the extent of young people's urban range prior to the 1970s. Scattered anecdotes are merely suggestive. For the 1920s, New York author Kate Simon, in this book, Bronx Primitive, recalls venturing on foot, aged around 10, from her apartment at 2029 La Fontaine to 183rd Street, a distance of half a mile, and sometimes a little further afield. 1937, by contrast, famous American urbanist Lewis Mumford observed that, and I quote, the activities of small children are still bounded by a walking distance of about a quarter of a mile. Elsewhere, Arthur Harding recalled walks as a six or seven year old in the 1890s to bathe in London's Victoria Park, a setting located a mile and a half from the cramped family home, and further trips with his friends Wally and Billy to Tower Bridge, a similar distance way on foot. While historical geographers Colin Pooley for Northwest England and Sanford Gaster for Inwood, which is at the top of Manhattan Island, have generated important primary evidence of a a more detailed and comparative nature, their findings only take us back as far as the 1940s and 1915, respectively. So for the long 19th century, the urban range of young people is hence rather unexamined in existing scholarship on walking. So how one wonders did factors of age, gender and class affect young people's movements within the city during this earlier period? The focus here on walking entails the exclusion of trips taken by a mixture of means. Hence, the probably exceptional adventure of young E. Morris Miller, barely seven in 1888, when he returned alone to North Melbourne on foot, train and tram from St Kilda Beach, some 15 kilometres to the south, falls outside my frame of analysis. It's important to note, however, that for the offspring um, of the middle classes, the advent of trams in particular could extend their urban horizons. Autobiographies and newspaper articles record quite young children climbing aboard trams to visit the beach, riding in the cab with the drivers and paying for tickets with stolen money. And a report on, on a tram, tramways conference in 1899 notes the existence of half-price uh, fares for children. By contrast, until entering their mid-teens, it is unlikely that most working-class children could afford to take up such an offer very regularly. A weekly wage in the 1890s for a Melbourne newsboy or novice flower seller of around five shillings did not go far, even if only pennies were needed to ride the trams. And the purportedly, von- uh, the purportedly vulnerable young street traders noted in 1887 as needing up to an hour each night to return home from central Melbourne were most probably travelling on foot. If they were walking, it would be no surprise. In London, Henry Mayhew found watercress girls walking up to nine or ten miles a day in the early in the early 1860s, alongside other juvenile traders covering the distances mentioned earlier. Now, of course, Mayhew was able to ask his subjects about their walks for work, and in a similar way, scholars of the contemporary period have conducted surveys with children about their journeys to school. But beyond the reach of the oral history interview, establishing such details is much more difficult. Yet a cache of documents lodged in the town clerk's files in Melbourne does allow for some informed speculation at least. In the 1890s, those responsible for greening the city were determined to crack down on the type of damage I alluded to earlier, uh, most notably in the central Fitzroy Gardens. In cases where those intercepted by uh, police, um, Park foreman and even the, even the council's dog collector in, or dog catcher. In cases where those intercepted were children, information supplied by enforcement agencies to the Park and Gardens Committee, detailing the alleged offence, its place and its timing, and the particulars of the offenders in question, presents an opportunity to examine the territory over which urban monsters roamed. And if only the screen was a bit bigger. No, never mind. So this table illustrates this data for a selection of cases for the late 1890s where a home street address is given. Don't worry if you can't read it at the back, so I'm going to go through a couple of cases now. Now it's evident that most of these individuals were fairly close to home, though certainly far enough away to elude parental supervision when they were accosted 
The majority hailed from working class districts, including Central Melbourne, Collingwood, Fitzroy and Richmond. Areas where small working men's cottages provided insufficient space to play or to socialise. So let's have a look at a couple of these cases in more detail. Bertie Hoey, aged 10, resided in Collingwood's Victoria Parade. He was intercepted a little over a kilometre from his house in November 1898, clutching a bird's nest and an assortment of bamboo <coughs> canes intended, he said, for use as fishing rods. Also in the party were James Marston and Thomas Heaney, aged 12 and 9, near neighbours from, from the same street as one another in Fitzroy, around a kilometre away, and an older lad, Victoria Townsend, 15, who had come further, two kilometres, from the other end of Victoria Parade. John Hennessy, by contrast, was unlucky in being apprehended alone in December 1900 for damage caused to shrubbery during a game of hide-and-seek. It's not a game that's best played on your own. You'd be waiting a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Age 10, he had walked to Curtin Square from Prince's Street in Carlton, a distance of just over 400 metres. Now, as you'll see, hopefully... Boys dominate this list of alleged offenders and often frequented the city's green spaces in groups. As they matured, increased confidence prompted them to venture further afield, and it's surely no coincidence that the longest journey recorded on the list, 3.15 kilometres, was undertaken by the oldest individual, 16-year-old John Carroll. Of course, the exact routes taken by the children to the open spaces in question cannot be known. And it's very likely that the figures shown in the table are an underestimate, given that they are calculated, using the software map info, on the assumption that the most direct paths were followed from home to park. Other sources from the period yield snippets of evidence regarding longer journeys. Oswald Barnett, for instance, recalls that as a young boy in the 1890s, he would walk with two friends to Camberfield, some five or six miles from his home in East Brunswick, Melbourne, for the purpose of shooting birds with catapults and climbing trees, both very popular activities at the time. <coughs> it seems then that some urban youngsters roamed over distances considerably greater than those listed in this table. Nonetheless, the evidence, just a, a portion of which I have on screen, is valuable in providing a comparative body of material across different locations and for a sustained period of time. It also supplies, and really, I can't stress how rare this material is, um, it supplies an extremely rare insight into the crisscrossing network of urban journeys made by young people in the late Victorian era. Now, the girls featured here present interesting cases. Ten-year-old Eliza Meehan, for instance, had walked around 960 metres from Little Collins Street to the Fitzroy Gardens. There, she and her companion Adelaide Douglas, also aged ten, address eligible, were apprehended cutting rhododendron flowers. The case of Letitia Keating, alias Hetty Miller, also intrigues. When questioned in the Carlton Gardens by Constable McPherson in October 1900 regarding a tree's broken branches and how they became so, Keating supplied a false name and address. Instead of living in Exhibition Street, a kilometre away, it transpired that Letitia and her three-year-old sister lived far closer to the park in question, at 35 Latrobe Street, a distance of just over 300 metres. The quick-minded 11-year-old had clearly hoped to escape punishment and hear no more <coughs> from the authorities. Instead, a court summons resulted. In contrast to the push factors associated with the working-class home, sources including autobiographies reveal a number of pull factors and ideological assumptions working to keep middle-class girls closer to the domestic sphere. While their brothers could more easily enjoy the liberty of walking city streets in their teenage years, girls' urban range was usually more limited, at least until a softening of restrictions by the turn of the century. Before their formal coming out into society as eligible women, girls fell under close supervision. They might, for instance, still enjoy public parks, but this commonly occurred under the watch of the family maid, an elderly relative or else alongside father, on his Sunday morning stroll. Kept on a tight rein, for example, for Mabel Brooks, a detested punishment consisted of being marched around the botanical gardens by her grandmother, passing other children who were allowed to play games. Mobility, recent scholarship has illustrated, 
is a thoroughly gendered privilege. For younger, middle-class children like Dorothy Moore and Mabel Brooks, walking was associated with fairly strict boundaries. Only those less concerned by notions of respectability, or by century's end, girls in their teens, could embark upon city walks, which approximated to those of their brothers, and even then, they ranged less far. And so to some conclusions. <coughs> For young people, the walking city did not end, or even begin to decline by 1870 or 1800, as has been asserted for adults. In Melbourne, London and New York, it lived on into the 20th century. For purposes of both walking and courting, young city dwellers, or purposes of both working and courting, young city dwellers were still overwhelmingly on foot in the early 1900s, carving out spaces for themselves. Sometimes they claimed the footpath as their exclusive domain, such as when a group of factory girls in turn of the century London were encountered, quote, walking arm in arm, singing and shouting and pushing other wayfarers off the curbstone. At other times they merged into everyday foot traffic or found pockets of space, particularly in parks, to conduct their games or pursue their courtships. Throughout the long 19th century, young people's urban walks followed shifting patterns. A variety of leisure zones were frequented at particular hours and on different days, the resultant pedestrian congestion further attuned to the rhythms of the seasons. By morning and evening, troops of youthful street traders came and went, chasing adult footfall in the intervening period as they sought to sell their wares. Across a variety of metropolitan locations, such outdoor activities were regulated only lightly until the 20th century, until well into the 20th century indeed. Especially in the summer months, truants in each of our cities searched on foot for adventure and play, while more obedient younger children were sent on errands throughout the year and at any time of day. The onset of compulsory education from the 1870s did have a gradual effect on the numbers of school-aged children to be found in and around the streets, but not on their locomotive habits. Growing numbers of children walked to their lessons by 1914, and that's an activity recalled fondly by many in diaries and autobiographies, and one that continued largely unchecked for city children until the era of the car-based school run in the later 20th century. Few young people ever ran completely free. Factors of class, gender and age circumscribed their urban walks in the long 19th century, and historians must resist the nostalgia that imbues some contemporary um, accounts which outline declining autonomy. In cities that increasingly privilege circulation by pedestrians, as well as new forms of transport, a tangle of regulations sped up the pace of urban living, moving the loiterers on and increasingly redefining social street spaces as transit thoroughfares. There were certainly more rules, but by 1900 there were also more freedoms, especially for girls and young women of all backgrounds. Amidst such changes, there were also continuities, points of age-related transition continued to involve walking. Young people most often walked to school or to bypass the school gates by playing <coughs> truant. They walked into the world of work and they sought romantic encounters on foot. Some young people did embrace the transport revolution taking place around them, yet for most young city dwellers, in 1914 as in 1850, the city remained a site for walking. A variety of sources and interpretive techniques can assist in reimagining a series of activities once so commonplace as to be considered worthy of only relatively scant comment. By placing street regulations alongside eyewitness descriptions, diary-based and autobiographical accounts alongside newspaper reports, and adult expressions of concern alongside um, extant quantitative evidence, we can hope to repopulate the streets of the past and bring to the fore the crucial place of youthful walking at the heart of urban history. Thank you.